I'm uh, glad pleasure to reintroduce uh, Lisa McNeil, and she's going to talk about um, the current Rift, which was a mission-specific platform a couple of years ago. This was a project that she um, sort of led and was coaching from. Okay, so yeah, I'll give you an overview of uh, one of the MSP expeditions that's happened in recent years, and this was um, drilling in the active current Rift, which is in central Greece. So this is from me, but on behalf of everybody who's been involved in the project. Okay, so I'll sort of start off with just a little bit of background about why we were interested um, and then show you um, what happened during the expedition and an example of life on an MSP, as we heard yesterday as well, um, and then some of the initial results. So why are we interested in this very earliest phase of rifting? Because that's what's happening in the current drift. So we can study this early phase in active rifts, something that's kind of missing if we're trying to look at um, long-term um, older rifted margins, for example. So the way to get at that early part of the rift phase is by looking at active rifts. Um, and ideally in places where we can get at um, information in high resolution, spatially and temporally, without overprinting, so it's got a simpler history, um, and we can actually have a better chance of um, dating material and getting at rates of process, which tend to be really poorly constrained. So things like strain rates, sediment flux rates. So there's a real need for chron chronology and that's really where IEDP came in here. And these rifts will tend to have a typical evolution from a terrestrial environment to a lacustrine environment through to a marine environment. And in the current rift, we're kind of in that the and marine kind of transition. And it's a, it's a really nice place where we have interplay between tectonics and faulting, which are creating the rift, um, interacting with sedimentation, but also with climate and paleo environment, with climate and tectonics interacting to control the flux of sediment into the basin. But again, we don't really know um, what dominates, uh, what changes through time and, what, and how quickly these processes can change. So why are we particularly interested in the current rift other than that it's one of these active rifts worldwide, of which there aren't actually too many, to be honest. It's got very high strain rates. So some of the highest extension rates in the world, up to about 15 to 20 millimeters a year and very high levels of seismicity. So it's, it's active and things are moving fast. It's also a young rift, um, about 5 million years probably um, of this particular part of the rift. Um, with the recent phase only about two million years old. And so it's got a relatively simple history. There's high sedimentation rates, partly because you've got these high set extension and subsidence rates. And we've also got a sea level reference frame because everything's happening close to sea level. So there's real potential for high resolution here and ways of, of actually um, dating and getting a chronology. The SINRA sediments are well preserved, particularly offshore. Um, and there are elements of the Sin Rift uh, preserved onshore as well, which I'll show you. It's also a self-contained small rift system. So we have the chance to characterize the entire tectonic and sedimentary rift, which is quite unusual. Um, so overall, a unique setting for studying early rift processes. And the pictures that you can see here on the left just showing you some of the larger earthquakes. And so the current rift is, whoops, sorry, never rather freeform mouse. This is the current thrift here. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse just south of the Gulf of Evia. And on the right, we can see the GPS vectors relative to uh, Eurasia. So what are we trying to do and, and, how, and where does IDP come into this? Um, so this is IDP drilling here was building on many decades of, of work in the current thrift, particularly starting in the early 1980s when there were a series of large earthquakes and it kind of attracted the attention of international scientists. But what we're really are missing is the ground truthing of the materials in the offshore sequence, and in particular, the chronology of the Sinria sequence. Um, and we have the potential to do that at high temporal resolution, hence drilling. So the idea is to integrate the chronology and depth constraints that we can get from drilling with our pre-existing seismic stratigraphy and fault networks and deeper center distributions that we can already map out from a really dense seismic network. So then we've also got high spatial resolution. And then we can use that information to feed our results into the onshore um, data that we have and modeling studies 
of the earlier rift sequences that are located on shore and also of surface processes so that we can try and work out how this rift has evolved but it's uh, also how the closed drainage system has evolved in time and space and get down to tens of thousands of years time scales and therefore unravel the relative roles of tectonics and climate on sediment flux and basin environment. And then the second um, uh, primary objective is to establish that fault and rift structural evolution, but have that important information about age and rate that we don't currently have. So very high, high resolution and the drilling primarily gives us, gives us this chronology information. But in fact, we found out so much more as I'll, as I'll show you. So this is the, the current thrift. Um, and what I'm showing you here is the fault map um, that was developed as a part of the process of going towards IDP drilling because we integrated the data. Um, there are many fault maps out there of the current thrift, but what we tried to do um, was try and pull together all of those data um, and have the, the best um, integrated fault map. So that's what you're seeing here. Um, the main active part of the rift is offshore today or around the coastline, but in the past, um, to the south of the Gulf of Corinth, there are areas of early parts of the rift system. And you can also see the, the three, three sites that we ended up drilling, so 78, 79 and 80, and I'll obviously show you those in more detail. So I'm not going to go into detail other than right at the end about how the rift and faults have evolved, um, but it's a fairly sort of, um, it's a nice story of a fairly sort of uh, complex sort of deeper centre arrangement, um, merging and integrating and a southern border fault system, which you can kind of see the main faults on the southern um, coast of the Gulf of Corinth, which have evolved and linked and now dominate um, controlling the substance in the rift. So this is what we see onshore, and it gives us some idea of the sorts of things that we might be drilling offshore. So there are these fantastic Gilbert fan deltas on the margin of the rift. Those are active today um, around the edges of the Gulf of Corinth, but we can also see ancient examples of those uplifted, which you can see in the top photo. And some of these are about 800 to 1,000 metres thick. So really fantastic sequences of, of sediments, which again, hopefully kind of spells out to you the sort of the, the the very high rates of subsidence. Um, in some places that's very coarse grained, some places finer grained. Um, and the reason that these uh, materials are exposed on shore is that in general, the dominant faults on the southern margin have been gradually stepping northwards into the hanging wall of the, of the fault. And therefore what's happening is material that was previously subsiding in a fault is now uplifting and therefore we see on land these formerly um, subsiding um, synriff sequences. And we now have this prominent um, southern shore fault controlling the geomorphology and causing the uplift. So I mentioned that we have extensive seismic data, so this is important for the site survey aspect. Um, and so this shows you, there are now more, the, this was the map that was compiled for our proposal and for our drilling proposal. Um, so there was a sort of a long sequence of different surveys of different um, frequencies and resolutions and depth penetrations, um, but collectively they produce a really dense network and hence this high spatial resolution. There are also a few um, piston cores, including some Marion Dufresne um, longer cores. Um, so a few of those around as well. So the plan was from a small number of deeper boreholes from drilling, we could correlate those to this data set and basically correlate and um, calibrate the stratigraphy around the entire rift basin. But a really key part of this was integrating and interpreting the fault networks and the stratigraphy from this seismic network. And this was a key requirement from IDP or rather from SEP or whatever it was called before that, um, before the proposal could proceed. So we ended up having to uh, basically launch and get funded um, a, a specific project to do that. Um, and that integration um, was published, it was done by Casey Nixon and that was published in 2016. So what did we know before drilling in terms of chronology? Well, one of the things that's um, interesting about the Gulf of Corinth is because of its position relative to sea level and because it has um, bounding sills, so it's sort of surrounded by potential connections to the open Mediterranean 
um, on at each end of the of the rift. And the particular one of interest is at the western end. So we've got the Rion Sill and the um, I'm not going to try and do some Greek here, but Aculus Cape Papas Sill. Um, these are both sitting at around minus 50 to minus 60 meters in the western end. And in the past, the Corinth Isthmus, which you may have seen with the Corinth Canal, um, would also have been a connection to the open Mediterranean. So it's close to sea level and it's got these bounding sills, which if you look at the, um, the depths of those, they indicate that during lows of sea level, the basin will be cut off from the Mediterranean and basically creating a semi-isolated basin. And so that has created, and we know this, this is confirmed from um, some shallow piston cores um, that reach back to the end of the last glacial. Um, and so we know that this has, um, or we, we, we believe from this uh, most recent phase from the cores, that that has generated alternating marine and isolated or lacustrine basin environments. And therefore there's a chance to tie it to glacio eustatic cycles. So that's what we did and that's what others have done um, to come up with a sort of an estimated um, seismic chronology, stratigraphic chronology. Um, and that's what you can see in the below diagram, this correlation to the sea level curve basically um, and the sill depth um, to try and interpret the data. And the seismic data do seem to have um, different characteristics that, that um, we are interpreted and correlated to those piston cores in the shallow section as, as correlating with these different intervals of different environments. So that was the initial chronology, um, but we really needed to um, prove that that was correct or um, what happened at depth as well was um, things start to get a bit more complicated. So that and other data suggested there were three main phases of rifting, two of which were likely preserved on shore, and the most recent of which was showing this really clear um, alternation um, through time. So we had some idea and, and certainly some things to test in terms of the chronology. So our objectives for the, um, for the expedition um, were as follows. So basically to obtain a high resolution chronology and environmental history which we would then use to do two main things, which was the fault and rift structural evolution of the rift and the surface processes um, that I mentioned before. In addition, we would also get information that would help with natural hazard assessment in terms of earthquakes and potentially landslides. And also, and this became actually even more important, give us a record of quaternary paleoclimate, um, hopefully at high resolution, but also the paleoenvironmental de development of a semi-isolated basin, of which there are some out there, obviously um, work in the Black Sea, for example, um, but this was going to be another of those, and that turned out to be really interesting. So in summary, what we did, we had our mission-specific platform expedition on the Fugro Synergy, which was the platform that um, ESO um, took on, and that took place in late 2017. And then we had the onshore phase in Bremen in February, 2018. And we drilled three sites and the intention was to cover the extended rift history, high resolution of the recent rift history, and then also look at a long rift variation. And we got nearly two kilometers of section cord, a um, little less of, of core material itself. Uh, our maximum drilling depth was about 700 meters below sea floor. Um, and the recovery was very good and we also uh, logged two of those sites. So I'll just before I sort of get into the expedition and, and some of the initial results, um, I just wanted to go through the proposal history. I don't want to scare you, um, but it is another sort of rather longish one. <laughs> so obviously things started off with sort of general work in the area and there were some quite important geophysical surveys that took place then. But the first uh, proposal was submitted in 2006 and in fact Although that was well received, uh, because we had to do this site survey data integration, it ended up being deactivated. Um, this was at a time within IDP where there was an, um, a study of all of the proposals and a deactivation of quite a lot of them. So we don't feel too bad about this, but basically we were waiting for the opportunity to do what, what SEP had asked us to do and we hadn't had that yet. Um, so we were actually deactivated. We then did run this project to integrate the data and importantly, that was funded by one of these NERC UK IDP virtual site survey um, funds. So that gave us a two year postdoc um, and that allowed us to, to do that job. We also had a proposal workshop also funded by that virtual site survey fund and also from the Nagellon Plus um, workshop funds. 
And so we were then able to submit a new proposal in 2014. So on the official record, it looks like we started in 2014, but that's not really true. And then that progressed fairly fast um, and was sent to the facility board in 2016. And then we went through the process or rather ESO went through the process of um, deciding what expeditions they were going to schedule, tendering, etc. Um, and then eventually 2017 was when we actually did the expedition. So why was it a mission specific platform? Because you might have noticed, well, surely you can, you can get into the Gulf of Corinth, it's connected to the Mediterranean. Um, and that's true. But unfortunately, um, they built a rather nice bridge um, a number of years ago at the western end. And there are also bridges crossing the Corinth Canal. And these are all just a little bit too low to comfortably get the JR underneath. In fact, you couldn't. Um, and even actually with the Fugro Synergy, they had to take the top of the rig off, which you can see in the bottom right, because actually, although that, that would have cleared the bridge, um, the bridge engineers um, like to have a, a bit more clearance rather than just sort of scraping under, which I suppose is fair enough. Um, so that's why we ha had to be an MSP. It's a lovely bridge, but it's a bit annoying. So this is the Fugro Synergy in Corinth Port um, on a sunny day, although it was rather cold um, because it was October to December. Quite an interesting, um, amusing anecdote is that some people who were on the expedition, um, I think thought Greece, wonderful shorts, uh, but they hadn't noticed it was um, December and it snows in Greece. So um, some people got rather cold. Anyway, um, so there's the ship. Um, and then bottom right, you can see the whole, whole crew um, in, in Bremen. Um, a few months later, and this is the crew on the on the ship. So you had a we have a, a small science party offshore. Um, so just nine um, scientists on the platform offshore, um, basically running running everything and also doing the ephemeral um, property measurements. So we did uh, running of the cores through the MSCL, um, doing some initial. Um, analysis of sediments and micropaleontology from basically to the base of the cores and doing the geochemistry in particular of the pore waters and also of course the, the logging. So this was I just thought it was interesting also just to show the makeup of the science party. Um, so yeah there were 32 scientists and nine offshore plus our expedition project managers or the old star scientists. Um, so there's quite a lot of people from Europe in this one, so it did get a bit skewed towards sort of European participations, um, which is a bit unusual. Um, but anyway, that shows you uh, participation. I think we had almost the entire Norwegian quota, although none of them were Norwegian. Some pictures of activities offshore. Um, so as has been explained with the MSPs, it's um, it's a different setup to the JR or CHICU, and um, so you have a series of containers where you work, um, and basically you're doing you're doing what you have to do rather than all of the analyses offshore. So you can see um, the cores being collected, and then you can also see an image of the geochemistry lab, and also of the lab where the micropaleontologists and um, sedimentologists doing some initial analysis. And then this is in Bremen. So then we have the full crew with us. And in fact, some things that we could do in Bremen that you wouldn't be able to do on the JR, for example, being able to do some palynology using HF. Um, so that was something that was really important here for the paleo environment. Um, anyway, you can see everybody um, mostly enjoying themselves, slightly mad geochemists in the upper right. Okay, so now I'll have a look at the, um, the sites and tell you a little bit about what we found. So this is the first site and remember yesterday actually when I was talking about the site survey I uh, sort of explained you know how would you go about um, picking your site depending on what you're after and as I said we were trying to do um, multiple things here we wanted to get as far back in time as possible so that we could get as much of the rift history as possible we did have a limitation of 750 meters below seafloor um, and so this site was really trying to do that trying to get back as far in time as possible so here we were drilling through both of the rift phases, trying to get as close to basement as we, as we possibly could. So this was the site um, on a horse block getting the condensed section. And then to complement that, we then wanted to get a high resolution um, picture of the most recent rift phase. And that's what this site did. So you can see here a much um, thicker section um, and most of it is in that upper rift sequence that's labeled SU2 here. So let's have a look at some of the results from those two sites. This is 78, which is the horse block, the first one. 
Um, and we did indeed find these alternating um, lithologies and environments um, that were being shown by the lithologies, the microfossils, and also the, the geochemistry, and also the physical properties were showing this variation as well with depth. And so the marine subunits in this upper unit, which was where they were really clear, um, commonly um, homogeneous mud, which is very exciting, we had a lot of mud. Basically, we had deep water, fine-grained, turbiditic and hemiplagic sediments were dominating. So it's quite interesting, the contrast with the margin, which is not very far away, where things are really very coarse grained. Um, and then you sort of quite rapidly reach this fine grain material. But marine and terrestrial um, microfossils were abundant, um, although not as abundant in, as in your sort of normal marine sequence. Whereas in the isolated or sort of lake subunits, we commonly had laminated sediments um, and thinner beds. Um, and we were seeing non-marine microfossils that were moderately um, moderate to abundant and a low abundance of marine microfossils, but still some presence. So some interesting, it wasn't black and white in terms of marine and lake. And then the lower unit was basically uh, more homogeneous, a lack of um, marine microfossils, but um, abundance of non-marine. So this suggested that at this point, um, we were predominantly in this kind of isolated environment, and maybe at this point the rift is sitting above sea level, or maybe protected by shallower bounding cells. So we're not seeing this alternating environment in that lower unit. Some really interesting transitions, though, just coming back to unit one. Um, really interesting sequences as you transition from the marine to the isolated. Um, and the sequence that you're seeing here was actually quite common in a number of those transitions. So we're doing quite a lot of analysis to look at how that, how that change occurred. And you know, hopefully also to some extent over what sort of time scale. So I mentioned that the physical properties also showed this alternating um, signature. So we're looking at density, color, and magnetic susceptibility. Um, and you can see that marine is blue, isolated green, um, and there's, there's definitely some distinctiveness to the signature. And we're still trying to work out what um, some of this is actually meaning, particularly the magnetic susceptibility. The, so I said before that um, fine grained turbidites are, are pretty common. So these tend to be quite thin and um, very frequent. Um, some of them are, are sandy uh, with sedimentary structures, but generally thin and fine um, sand silt turbidites and often with um, thick sequences of homogeneous, homogeneous mud. Slumps and debrites were present, but really quite rare, but some beautiful sequences of, of these present as well. In the third site in the eastern part of the, of the rift, um, we had sort of a different approach and a different sequence expected and found. So here the section is much thinner. This part of the rift has probably evolved a little bit differently. And we have reduced subsidence and sediment accumulation rates here. And we were able to pretty much get to the bottom of the sedimentary sequence and back to basement. And here we've got marine, lake, and even terrestrial environments here. So a really interesting interplay of subsidence, fault activity, sea level, and basin opening. And we were able to get back to the earlier rift phase, possibly even late Miocene, Pliocene at the base of the hole. So I'll just kind of show you what we found. Um, so we had the, the upper part of the section was more similar to the other boreholes. But as we got to the base of that, we were starting to see shallow marine assemblages. So and then beneath that, not surprisingly, we actually had terrestrial deposits. We had alluvial fan and fluvial deposits. Beautiful colours here because we're actually sourcing the sediment from an ophiolite on shore. Um, and then below that, we then got back into subaqueous. Um, it looks like it's probably marine, maybe a shallow marine basin. Um, and then right at the base, we had a basal conglomerate. So a really fantastic site for you know, a whole range of environments and lithologies. So just to come back to the environments and just to sort of summarize what we found, um, because this is, this is really, I think, what, I, what we underestimated as being, being interesting. Um, because it's, it's turned out to be fascinating and really complicated. Um, maybe we're just being a bit naive. Um, but, you know, we've got these marine assemblages which have got um, benthic forearms, um, sponge spicules, as well as other um, sort of more normal um, uh, marine microfossils, um, but not your sort of normal conventional marine um, assemblage. 
And then in the isolated assemblages, non-marine diatoms um, and various other things that I'm going to go into. But in both of these, they tend to be different between the different isolated and marine sequences um, and some really unusual um, examples of these, of these. So, and then we've also got the, the shallow marine assemblages as well. So there's a lot of work going on trying to um, analyze the, the microfossil assemblages um, palynology as well um, to try and better understand the, the environment. And we've actually got quite a lot of um, other scientists involved um, to do that, to look at, for example, ostracods and, and various other things. So we hope there'll be some really interesting work here. Sorry, forgot about the arrows. So this is sort of a summary of, the, of those units. So it turns out that in the interglacial marine units, we've actually got lower sediment accumulation rates than in the glacial um, isolated subunits. So in fact, they tend to be two to seven times the, the accumulation rates as in the marine. Um, so that's interesting. And our interpretation of this by coupling it with the um, palynology is that we've got quite distinctive changes in vegetation on the rift flanks. So mixed forests in the interglacial periods and open grasslands in the glacial periods. And so the interpretation is that that is leading to an increased sediment supply during the glacials, which is increasing those sedimentation rates. And these sedimentation rates are, are pretty high relative to other rift, rift basins too. It also looks like the turbidite frequency is higher during those glacial periods too. Maybe that's also a climate effect. We did notice that the Holocene is an exception though, um, and that actually has very high accumulation rates. And that's probably due to anthropogenic effects because those have been in action in terms of deforestation in the last 6,000 years. So some really interesting contrasts um, that are starting to tell us something about the climatic influence on sedimentation in, in basins of this kind. I mentioned we did some uh, downhole logging, and I'm just going to come back to those points in, in a moment as well. We, um, as I said, we logged two sites, and this site, the last site, um, we logged pretty completely. Um, so this has given us in situ gamma ray, magsas, resistivity, and velocity data. There's a really good correspondence between the core physical properties and these downhole logs. So the logs, the logging data are also showing this distinctive signal between the marine and isolated intervals. And importantly, um, we're also gaining velocity information. It's not brilliant, but we're gaining velocity information that will help us to integrate the boreholes into the seismic data, because obviously we need to make that kind of depth to time um, correlation to do that. So we are also able to correlate the boreholes to each other. So we're coming up with a chronology. Um, and so this is the correlation. Apologies, my cat's just passing through. Um, so we found that the um, boundary between the two most recent rift phases is around 700 to 800,000 years, which is not too far off from what our estimates were, but to be honest, there were about four or five different estimates of this age. And we estimate that the base of the Sun Rift sediments, so the earliest, is around two to two and a half million years. So we've been able to um, refine previous estimates and get a better idea of that, even though we didn't necessarily reach, reach the base during the drilling. And this just summarizes um, some of the, um, those results that I was talking about in terms of sedimentation. We were able to publish this um, about a year or so afterwards, after the expedition. And this really just summarizes those distinctive sedimentation environmental patterns that I was inferring. So these changes in um, sedimentation rates. Um, the other thing that I, I didn't uh, mention, uh, so you can actually see, sorry, the sediment, whoops, cool. sorry, hang on. <laughs> I have a very um, excitable mouse. Excuse me a moment, I just have to return. Okay. Okay. So on the right hand side, you can see those sedimentation rates varying through time. So that's the crucial one to be looking at. Um, so the other thing that I didn't mention was that, that interestingly, although the subsidence rates, um, the sediments supply rates are very high, subs it does appear to not be able to keep pace with subsidence because the basin is underfilled throughout. So that's another interesting point. And just to finish, really, um, this is the um, some information that was gathered in advance of the drilling, but now has been updated. And this is just showing you the rift deeper center development and the basin fill. So this is the work that Casey Nixon was doing. Um, so by integrating the seismic data, but now we obviously have much better idea of chronology. And so this is showing you from sort of top left to bottom right 
how those deeper centers have evolved, how the fault network has evolved through time. Um, and basically it's gone from sort of two deeper centers in the earlier phase, those have merged, the rift polarity has changed, and we've also now got a sort of a simpler um, primary fault system on the southern shore that has linked together over a fairly short time period. Um, and we now can use these isopacks um, to compare with sediment supply from onshore, um, and we've got a better constraint on thicknesses of the sediments offshore and of the chronology. So just to conclude, um, we've got this unprecedented um, combination of geophysical and geological data sets in the Corinth Rift to enable us to unravel early rift processes at high resolution. And the drilling's now providing the absolute chronology as well as ground truth of lithology and environments. And we're still adding new age data. What I showed you here was really just some preliminary information based on that correlation with the sea level curve um, and some paleo mag data, but we're adding to that tephra chronology stable isotopes where we can. Obviously that's um, difficult in the isolated sections. Um, we can do radiocarbon, we've already done that. Uranium series on aragonite, um, more magnetostrat, including RPI, relative paleo intensity, and further biostratigraphy. So we're gradually building a better chronological model. But we'll, we'll hopefully be able to extract, you know, this sort of tectonic sea level climate interaction and sedimentation in the basin. Um, but yeah, important takeaway from the, the most recent results is that the sedimentation rates are much higher in the glacial period, um, turbidite frequency much higher, and potentially more sand as well. And we think this is probably largely a climatic and vegetation control. Um, and then, yeah, finally, just the rift deep presenter um, fault evolution. Probably the, the highest resolution information we have on how that happens is, is now in this, in this rift. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Lisa, there are some yeah. questions in the chat. Can you see those? Yeah. So Juliana asks, do you get support from IDP to obtain seismics for different sources, academia and industry, or is everything left to the proponents to solve? It's sort of the latter. Although, as I said, in this particular case, we did get funding from UK IDP to do the virtual site survey, which was really integrating all of the existing data. But we have had in UK IDP in the past funding to actually collect new site survey data. The UK is a little bit unusual in that worldwide. Um, so generally it's up to you as proponents to find um, sources of funding to do that. Um, and then, I mean, I think it's worth saying that, that you know, IODP centrally has no funds for these sorts of things. So it goes back yeah. to proponents, individual countries, nationality and member countries, basically. Yeah. Um, in the UK, we made a decision about a decade ago um, that because the site survey is such a key component to preparing these proposals, we would set aside funds specifically for site surveys. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree. It's, it's, it's a shame that other, more countries have not been able to do that, but that's, uh, yeah. Um, okay, uh, and then Rachel says, um, were you limited to three sites? Did you initially request more in the proposal? Um, so, what we were able to do in its combination of number of sites and how deep we could drill. And that was limited by um, basically the likely um, rate of penetration and depth that we would be able to reach from this platform. Um, so we were told you can't go any deeper than 750 meters. Um, and then we were given some estimates as to how long that would take. Um, and so therefore we, we found for, it was basically a two month expedition. Um, that's what led us to the three sites. I mean, we felt we could do what we needed to do with three sites. It would have been advantageous to be able to drill deeper than that 750 meters. It's because although the, recover, the recovery is amazing and the cores are, are great, um, but for us, we really did want to get to as deep as possible. <laughs> so we, we really had to look, work quite hard to find sites which would have that sort of condensed section so that we could get as early in the record as we possibly could. And Juliana, one more question. I was wondering if we could get support for obtaining permission of using existing seismics. Um, I mean, certainly we'll do everything to sort of assist and, may, and also SEP often gives um, suggestions. You know, I mentioned yesterday in the site survey, or Becky had put in a slide about possible sources of existing seismic data. Um, and we sometimes on SEP make suggestions. If somebody knows of existing seismic data, we kind of prompt the proponents to go and find 
certain things. And I suppose you could argue that the the reviews, if they're positive, are giving you hopefully some support in, in finding data. Um, but there isn't sort of beyond that, there isn't really sort of physical support for obtaining permission. And um, one thing that I mean, IDP is doing though is, is trying to increase the availability of existing seismic data that's been used in the past. So I mentioned you've got this, this database where people upload their data and they're working really hard to make sure that that's actually available to everybody. So that if you're working in an area where that's relevant, you've got another source of data there. I mean, one thing I was going to add, Lisa, um, was that, um, and I don't know if there's anyone from ECORD actually on the line who can comment on this, but there was an industrial liaison panel um, mm. that, Good point. You know, one of its roles could be to assist people to um, to get hold of or even track down the existence of industry data, yeah. um, certainly within in European waters. Yeah, um, and I don't know whether anyone else can comment on, on that. Um, I'll just say that panel hasn't been overly active in recent years. No, that, that is a good point. Um, and, and certainly in the UK, um, we're, we're trying to establish a, a re-establish a UK uh, industrial group. Um, we might be able to ha help with, with that, um, certainly with, with things around the UK, either um, with industrial contacts or with groups like the, the British Geological Survey. Yeah, 